do not make any mistake about it. I'm going to look in the camera and say, indie filmmakers, this is a tough business. All right. It's a great business. It's a lot of fun. If you, if you do well, you can make a lot of money, but it is not easy. This is not for the faint of heart. Right. So if you think making the film is tough, selling it is way tougher. Welcome to Industry Insights. My name is Jim Ellis, and this is Elias Acosta, and we're here to talk to Mr. Jeff Deverett about distribution. Jeff's been an independent producer, director, and now he's consulting. He's also a professor, very successful in uh, selling his films. And uh, so looking forward to a wonderful time here with Jeff. Uh, I think... Uh, uh the topics today is about distribution, and I think it's going to bleed over to the marketing side, and I think he's going to get excited about that because <laughs> that's his favorite topic. So um, that's everybody should stay tuned all the time. Don't blink, don't move, because now we have Mr. Deverett. So they're going to talk about that and going to walk us through a whole process. It's so complicated for many people, but yeah. hopefully yeah. we'll, we'll get a little light. Yeah, distribution is so important. Everybody has a great idea for movies, mm. and yet um, even getting to the point of finishing the film, if you don't mm. have distribution, you're pretty That's much correct. sitting on a big hole, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is a very important subject. Jeff did start out in Canada uh, in, dis in the distribution uh, field, and then uh, so then thought it'd be more fun to make movies, so he got involved in that mm. as well. Uh, so it's been uh, quite a journey and I think uh, you'll enjoy this conversation. So yeah, and welcome back because we got such a incredible response uh, from the first show that you were here. So it's we're so uh, glad that you are back, and let's get right on to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds good. Uh, so yeah, let us know how you got involved in distribution early on in Canada. Okay, well, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Uh, so I wanted to like my whole life I wanted since I was a teenager I wanted to be a filmmaker and my dad said to me when you say filmmaker do you want to be a producer or a director and I said I don't know what's the difference and I was 15 years old right he said well if you want to be a producer it's all business so if, you know if you want to do that you're going to deal with numbers and legals and contracts and all that you should either go to business school or film school or, or, or uh, law school and he said, if, but if you want to be a director, it's all artistic. It's storytelling on set. And then you should go to film school. And now, was, said, he in the, was no, he in the industry? No, no, but he just knew enough about oh. that. Yeah. So I said, you know, the producing thing, that sounds kind of cool. I'm going to go that direction. So after high school, I went to university and I got a commerce degree, like finance degree in undergrad. And then I went to law school and I got a law degree. But right out of law school, I decided that I am going to go work for a film production company because that's what I wanted to do is produce films. So instead of practicing law, I said, no, no, I'm going to put myself in into industry, which you do sometimes. Um, and so I applied to a whole bunch of production companies thinking I'm going to make movies, right? I'm going to learn how to produce movies. So I got back a lot of responses saying, you know, there's, we have no jobs available in production, but you would probably be pretty good in distribution because you know legals and finance and you got a, you know, sort of a good personality for selling. So I ended up taking a job in the distribution department of a film company as opposed to the production department and thinking, okay, you know, I'll do that. I'll get my foot in the door and then I'll transition. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really know even what distribution was, hmm. right? So I get in there and within three weeks, I'm in Cannes at the Cannes film market. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm thinking, that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, mm -hmm. but I'm at the market. I'm not at the festival. Yeah. You know, I'm not celebrating the films. We're selling them. Yeah. You know, what was the name of that company? Was it worldwide? Uh... No, no, that that's new world, new world, new world. It was new world. Yeah. Okay. So, so that wasn't the first job. The first mm -hmm. job was a smaller Canadian um, production company with a distribution arm. Um, New World was the second job. Okay. So New World was Roger Corman's company and it was an American company. So I went from that job to New World. Okay. Okay. But anyways, and I've transitioned a few times, but anyways, so distribution. So I thought, okay, I'll, you know, do it for a year or two, get my foot in the door, get well liked, and then I'll transition into production. Well, guess what? That year or two turned into 22 years. 
22 years I spent in distribution, selling, buying, acquiring, and, you know, and doing sales internationally and domestically. And it, you know, I became a specialist in, at that time it was VHS. Then it was home entertainment. We call it VHS, DVD, television, then digital came in. So I went through all those stages and I really learned how movies get sold and how much money they get sold for. And I'm talking, you know, internationally. So I learned the value of what the business side of the movie business is in terms of revenue. Mm. And that prepared me very, very well. And then one day I went to my wife and I said, honey, I need to have a midlife crisis. And she Mm. said, really? And I go, yeah. And here's the three options. Okay. Either I go buy like a really expensive red sports car. Mm. Two, Mm. I find myself a really hot young girlfriend. (laughs) Or three, I make a movie. <laughs> and she goes, oh, three, make a movie. three for sure. Make the movie. And I go, yeah. I, and I say to her, bad choice, honey. The oh. movie's going to cost twice as much as the car and the girlfriend. Right, right, so right. anyways, but that's, I said, I've, the time has come where, so I had actually. This is I, a good note, Elias. Write this down, you know, how to deal with your wife. This is a big deal. You know, no, my wife's great. But anyway, so I said, um, see, at the time I had worked for in a distribution operation for about 16 years. And then I left and started my own company. So I own the distribution company at the time and we were well positioned. And I said, the time has come now for me to really live my dream and go into production and start making the movies and doing what I really wanted to do, which was produce and be on the artistic side. But the good news is I had the wherewithal to do it because I had distribution built in. I own the company. So I knew where my distribution was coming. I didn't have to worry about that afterwards. So it was much easier for me to finance and and understand the cash flow and everything because I understood the whole back end really well and was confident with it. You know, people said, how are you going to distribute? I said, I'm going to put it through this, this, this channel. I'm not going to get a distributor. I am the distributor, Mm -hmm. which made life a lot easier and far more profitable. So that's how I did it. So, but I knew nothing about production, you know, and as I told you, you know, in another conversation we had, like, I really rely a lot on my production people to help me with that. I don't know lenses. I don't know lighting. I don't know a lot of the cinematography stuff because I didn't go to film school. You know, you asked me about contracts and finance and speak all day. So I hook myself up and I always surround myself by really, really strong production people who understand what I don't know and share my vision and help me through it. And that's how it works. So, you know, so I've since made seven feature films that way. And, you know, I've started to direct and write and everything. So it's been a lot of fun creatively. Um, but I still do all my own distribution. Oh, you do? Okay. Well, because I mm-hmm. know it. Now I'm not as involved, you know, especially internationally, but I'm well connected. So I, there's a lot of agents and distributors that I did business with for years worldwide that I still do business with. Uh, you know, some of them are retiring, but um, for the most part, I, I now the game has changed a lot. Yeah, that was yeah. A so good distribution question. has changed totally over the years, and you need to pivot as it changes. Mm-hmm. You need to change mm-hmm. with it. So a lot of you know a lot of other people who talk on you know master classes and podcasts, they're always talking about what happened thirty years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, like I had a client, exactly. I had an mm-hmm. independent client said, well, you know, one of my you know, guys I'm dealing with, you know, he used to sell Eddie Murphy movies. And I said, yeah, that's not the same. Eddie Murphy 30 years ago was like the king of the industry. I mean, mm-hmm. all you had to do was sneeze and you sell an Eddie, Mur- Eddie Murphy movie. I mean, the business, you can't compare what happened 25, 30 years ago to what's happening today. I mean, it's a completely different distribution landscape. Digital has changed everything mm-hmm. and streaming has changed digital. So I don't know where you want to start. You want to start today and talk about, I think we should just get into what's going on today. I think so. Or we can talk pre-pandemic because that changed a lot too. Yeah, Yeah, I think uh, starting today and then also uh, where is it going? And because a lot of folks are trying to figure that out, you know, trying to get in on the ground floor of where it's going. So that's another subject we can cover. But I think we should be, where where are we today? Because all the classic formats and, crumble, right? Yep. And then right at that pandemic it started, we discovered new things and all of a sudden after now you just saw when Netflix said lost two hundred thousand uh, yeah, subscribers. But that, yeah. That, okay. for, but for example, if that have to do with anything, 
because people are talking about. Well, let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah, sure. So What's your opinion on what happened? happened? On the Netflix thing? Yeah, what happened? Netflix has 200 million subscribers that exactly. they publish. Mm -hmm. Might be even more. They lost 200,000. Mm. That's not even a rounding error for them. It's it's a joke. I mean, the first thing I was going to do was buy Netflix stock because 200,000 is nothing for them. Mm. They're still the masters of the universe. They control the streaming world, basically. Yeah. And, and it's all about programming and they're, they have unbelievably good programming right. and they're in the game. And I would say, don't worry about Netflix for now. Now, mm. the issue with Netflix and all the other streaming platforms is how much can a consumer consume? Like, I don't know about you guys, but I have, I subscribe to six <laughs> platforms right now. And frankly, it's a little too much because I can't consume that much product. I mean, Disney yeah. alone, look what you yeah. get when for whatever it is, eight bucks a month or whatever. I mean, you're yeah. getting the Marvel universe, the Star Wars universe, all the Disney classics, all their movies. I mean, it's, you can't possibly in 10 lifetimes consume all that. Mm -hmm. Netflix with all their originals, you know, Hulu, Paramount Plus. I mean, all yeah. these, like HBO Max, how do you possibly consume all that as a consumer? So right now it's going to boil down to what the consumers can, you're talking about the future. It's, there could be consolidation because consumers, it's just too complicated for consumers. And, you know, the way you bring a consumer onto a platform is you offer them a program they want. There's no loyalty anymore to the platform. Nobody exactly. subscribes to Netflix because of Netflix. It used to be you go to Disney because the Disney brand. Mm -hmm. Now you go because the programming is good. You say, hey, right. like I subscribe to Apple because I wanted to watch Ted Lasso and The Morning Show. Mm -hmm. You know, and now I'm watching, you know, their uh, We Crashed and, you know, so... But if they don't have the shows I want, I'm not subscribing to them. It's about the content. Right. So the streamers know that. And that's why they spend so much money on gigantic content. I mean, that's what Netflix is doing. They're, they're primarily making their own content now. Very, very high level, sophisticated, right. very entertaining, you know, A-list actor content. Because that drives subscribers. Yeah. That's how you get them. The same like Apple have just grown into Correct. bringing eight lists, you know, and it's because they, they spend more money on the programming mm -hmm. in order to attract the subscribers. Because mm -hmm. when you're you're not going to subscribe to a, a, a platform unless they have the program you want. That's what you go for. The way Disney got me was they, and you know, it was a brilliant strategy. They licensed the play Hamilton, and they mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, yeah. but when Disney kind of launched, they they did a big promotion for. They did a six camera shoot of the production of Hamilton, the play it was fantastic. I, I hadn't seen it on Broadway. I love, you know, that musicals. I wanted to see it. And this was a great way to see it. And, and it was, you know, it was done really, really professionally. And, you know, it was basically a trial sign on to Disney and check this out. And I just stayed because then they had other programming elements, mm. you know? So uh, do you think these streamers are going to have to niche in the future? In other words, uh, pick certain categories or genres of films to attract certain audiences, or do you think they can just stay in a general category and compete with each other? I mean, obviously great question. Hard to say. <laughs> I'm sure they're all talking about that in their boardrooms. Um, I would say there are lots of niche ones already. I mean, like you look in the horror world, you know, Shudder is hundred percent horror. These, so there's already the niche platforms that exist. There's got to be, you know, 25 faith-based platforms just for that type of thing. Right. So those are already niche that have those audiences, the mainstream ones. I, I don't think they're going to niche out because they don't need to, because they can go in any direction and attract audiences, you know, like why, you know, big studio, HBO, Paramount, Disney. I mean, they can go in any direction. They have the wherewithal, the, the, the money, the facilities, the, you know, the knowledge to market it. So I doubt it. Um, the only question, I think the big question is how much can the consumers, you know, what's their tolerance level to paying a certain amount? Cause this mm -hmm. happened, this happened, you know, 25 years ago in cable TV or 30 years ago it was like, okay, now you've got basic cable. Then you're going to have the specialty channels. Then you're going to, you're going to have HBO, you're going to have ESPN, you know, and then you start building your package. And all of a sudden your $50 a month turns into $150 a month for your cable subscription. It's like enough's enough. We, we can't watch this much television. So this is exactly what's happening with streaming now. It's like, okay, we started with Netflix. Now we added these five services. Now we're going to add five more. And sooner or later, you're going to be up to $200 a month. It's like, do I really need to spend that? What mm -hmm. do I really need to watch? Right. So I don't know, but if you ask me to do the crystal ball thing, I would say 
that there's probably going, and there's already starting some of these services where they pick and choose, they Apple pick certain programming out of each of the streamers and they can offer you, say, bundles of the shows you want to watch from the streamers. And maybe there'll be a consolidated model where I pay $50 a month and I get to pick my top 10 shows, mm. something like that. I could see that happening because that's very consumer friendly. And that would work for somebody like me. Right. Because I don't need all of the Netflix programming. I need like five of their top shows that I really enjoy. And the rest of it, you know, I just don't have any interest or time to watch. Yeah. Mm. So something like that may happen. but. Uh, you know, that's going to be the question. It really is based on consumer appetite and, and you know, propensity to spend. So it's starting, uh, and then going back to, to the filmmaker, the indie filmmaker, and when they craft their production and thinking where they're going to take it in, uh, how do they start even thinking going to which stream is perfect for it? They have just a movie finished, but they don't know what the next steps are. Okay. So let's let's get real here, okay? There is a gigantic difference between the what I'm going to call the studio slash big streamer in uh, film business and mm -hmm. the indie film business. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what's happened recently, certainly over the pandemic, like everybody said, "Wow, we got like there used to be only two or three streamers, you know, it was Netflix and Hulu, and you know maybe some mm -hmm. small ones. Now we've got all the." big studios in and Viacom and CBS, everybody's in on it, right? So there's so much more programming that is required. Hence, it's going to be a field day. Everybody's going to need programming. So now the content is king and let's, everybody make stuff and they'll, they need it to put it on. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. It didn't happen because what they need is high budget, high concept, expensive programming because their business is getting subscribers. And you do not get subscribed. You know, I can say this because I'm an indie filmmaker, yeah. but you don't get subscribers with indie films. Yeah. The odd, odd, odd indie film, you know, like Moonlight or something that wins the Oscar or something like that is attractive to a subscriber. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, subscribers aren't interested in indie films. They're interested yeah. in the high concept stuff that's being produced internally in these places. Okay. okay? So the truth is Netflix and some of the other streaming platforms, it's actually way, way, way more difficult to get an indie film on. So the first year, like I sold my first film to Netflix in, nine, in, in uh, 2015. It's full out and it was a gymnastics film. And in order, you know, we timed it for the 2016 Olympics. The year I sold that film to them, they bought, they told me they bought 900 independent films that year. They weren't even in the Netflix the original business at that mm -hmm. time. They hadn't started that. All right. Two years later, the next film was Kiss and Cry. That year, they bought 600 independent films. Two years after that was Full Out 2, You Got This, 300 independent films. Hmm. Today, I can't speak for Netflix, but if you had to me to guess, I'd say they bought less than 100 independent films. Hmm. And that is because they're making most of their own yeah. content, you know, internally hmm. because it's bigger. They can afford it. They have gigantic cash flow, so they can afford to spend a lot of money and indie films do not attract subscribers so unless they're super special or something mm. is unique about them. So the indie film business has gotten actually, it's way more challenging to sell. Not, but when I say the platforms, mm. I'm talking the subscription video yeah. on demand, yeah. the SVOD platforms. Yeah. We'll get into the transactionally and AVOD, the advertising stuff later. That's where most indie films go. But the big ones that everybody talks about are the subscription yeah. ones you know, which are the big, you know, Netflix, the, the ones you subscribe on a monthly basis to, you know, and, and commercial free. So the move that you, we saw uh, Amazon by MGM. So do you think that bring them to that category uh, uh, where Netflix and the other big guys going to be? Do you think Amazon is going to be a big player? Amazon's already a big player. Yeah. I mean, they, they're a gigantic player because they have eyeballs and they have customers mm -hmm. So, and they, they know marketing, they know how to reach people. So for that reason, they're always going to be a big player at some point, you know, there is some creatives involved, right? You know, yeah. you got to, hopefully the creative department is choosing the right shows that are attractive to people and doing them really well. But yeah, of course, Amazon, Amazon's yeah. a, could never discount Amazon, yeah. but you know, like somebody every once in a while, something some programmer or content comes along that just fools everybody and yeah. they didn't expect it. And it's really good. Like I'll give you a perfect example. 
you know, Netflix takes a lot of chances and I, my, I applaud yeah. them for this. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they took a big chance with the squid game, mm -hmm. you know, that Korean really? show right, right. now. Now it wasn't a huge chance because in Korea it was a gigantic hit, right? But dubbing a Korean show into English and putting it on, oh, okay. but it was a gigantic hit because it was a great concept. And, you know, people were, you know, the question was, would people watch Americans, would they watch yeah. a dubbed show? Yeah. Usually it's the other way around. You know, you're dubbing English, you know, American shows into other languages. But they've done that a lot successfully now. Um, they take chances and, you know, sometimes they hit home runs with it. Yeah. And they've done that quite yeah. a few times now. So, but not everything works. Yeah. Sometimes That's you take correct. a chance, it doesn't work. So going back to um, these streamers, if they're not looking for indie films or they're looking for them less and less, as an indie film producer, um, what do you... Where do we go? Um, what is commercially viable? You know, great. For okay. Now, now we're into the discussion. This is great. All right. So first of all, do not make any mistake about it. I'm going to look in the camera and say, indie filmmakers, this is a tough business. All right. It's a great business. It's a lot of fun. If you, if you do well, you can make a lot of money, but it is not easy. This is not for the faint of heart. All right. So if you think making the film is tough, selling it is way tougher. So where do you go? What's commercially viable? All right. At the end of the day, you got to, it starts with a good film. You got to have, you got to be telling a good story. Like I'm talking narratives. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, docs, right. okay. Even documentaries, but um, by the way, shorts, there's no market for shorts. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. You got to have feature length mm -hmm. content or, you know, feature length content now could be even an hour because a streamer would be willing to do that. There's, there's, there's no rules. Mm -hmm. It's not like television where you kind of have to come in at 22 minutes or 44 minutes. So you fit into a television hour. With streaming, that's no commercials. You can fit into any time frame. You can make 106 minutes and, you know, it's fine. No problem. All right. But there's got to be enough substance to it where an audience will engage with it. All right. So generally they want to see an hour or more, you know, with a movie, it's usually 90 to 120 minutes, but there's these epic long movies, but generally you got to, so it starts, it always, and it always will start with good content. If you don't have good content, you're not in the game. So if you, if you think, if your excuse is an indie, indie filmmaker, you say, well, I only had $200,000, so I tried my best and how come nobody wants to watch it? Guess what? Your best wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's the bottom line. You learned, you tried, so, you know, and you did it on what you could do it. And I applaud you for that, but don't expect an audience to pay money for something that is substandard relative to what they're paying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, relative to a hundred million dollar, you know, Star Wars movie or something like that. Like this is what you're competing against. So if you really have any expectations to be commercially viable, make something that an audience truly wants to see. And if you're a really good filmmaker, you can make it for 200,000. You know, it's, there's no rules as to how much you have to spend. The rule is make something that's super entertaining and engaging for an audience. Okay. Okay, that's the number one rule. If you don't do that, you're not in the game. So I never be, everybody says, oh, Jeff, you, do, you don't spend enough time and, and attention on, on the, the artistic side. I say, what are you talking about? Mm. There's no art. There's no business. Right. This is the business of selling art. So of course I spend time on the artistic side. I say like, you have nothing to sell if you don't have something good artistically. So I totally appreciate that. All right. Make a good movie. Bottom line. That's where it starts. Okay. Now, assuming you've made a good movie. All right. You can't sell a shitty movie. Excuse me. French, French. Let's say you've made a good movie. Now, obviously everybody wants to get onto a subscription streaming platform like Netflix. Netflix is the Holy grail, right? Everybody says, I want to get on Netflix or something like that. Apple, Hulu, whatever. Number one, you can't do it as an indie filmmaker anymore. They don't take meetings. You have exactly. to use a distributor or an agent or some lawyer who's connected, who's an agent. So you have to, that's mm -hmm. the rules. They publish that. Mm -hmm. they, do, they, they do not engage at all. They won't even look at your stuff. Anything that's non-solicited, you can't submit even anymore. Yeah. So that is why distributors still play a very important role. But in order to get into an SVOD streaming platform, like subscription video, um, you have to be dealing with a company that actually is at that level of distribution company. So number one is, if you're dealing with a distribution company that does not have a connection with the streaming platforms, then they're going to have to deal with another distribution company. So you're going to end up paying two or three levels of commissions. So, and frankly, the bigger distribution companies that have those relationships, a lot of times don't want to look at smaller films because they're dealing with primarily bigger films. 
So that's tricky now. It's tricky to navigate that, even to find a distributor who will even look at your film at the level that they could even introduce it to a Netflix. Now there are, and I say, when I say Netflix, I'm just talking about all big streamers. streamers, Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just calling it Netflix because they're still the the number one. Um, There are aggregators and aggregator is more or less a technology company that, you know, prepares your movie for delivery to streaming platforms. I mean, a lot of distributors use aggregators. Um, So there are several aggregators who offer the service of pitching to the, you know, the SVOD. And by the way, SVOD Mm -hmm. platforms are what we call curated meaning you can't just load your product up to it. They have to choose you. They have to pick you, which is what all television is. It's all curated, right? So they can pitch to the curated platforms, you know, all the big streaming platforms on your behalf because they have a relationship and they pitch once a month and you pay a fee for them to pitch. And the question always, and generally the pitch comes back, sorry, thanks a lot. We're not interested. And then you always think, did they even pitch it? You know, why did I pay $2,000? Like, did I even get a pitch? Mm Mm-hmm. What do they even submit the title? So you never know, but sometimes it's better than nothing. And I'm not saying they're not honest, but the problem is they just don't need indie product because they have so much bigger right. stuff. All right. But, so if you are able to get onto, I'm going to say that less than one in a hundred, less than 1% of indie feature films get onto a subscription platform. And if so, you, I, it's got to be really good, really special, something about it that you've done in the marketing to create audience awareness or something like that, or win an Academy Award or something. Those are the films that are going to get on, the indie films, all right? The rest of them likely aren't going to get on. So your expectation in making the film has to be, you're probably not going to get onto one of those platforms. But I'm not saying don't try. You got to try. I mean, you've made this film, you put your heart and soul into it. So try your best, but don't build your business plan around it and don't necessarily expect it, all right? But hopefully it will happen. All right. So it's a very low percentage, but hopefully you'll be in that category. So the question is what happens with the other 99 that don't get on? Where do they go? So the next level is what we call transactional video on demand. And that would be the classic, say, iTunes, which is called Apple TV now. But, you know, we still refer to it. Our generation is iTunes, which or Amazon, you know, or Google Play or um, Voodoo. These are the platforms that you basically load your pro- film onto and people come and transact with it, meaning they either rent it for, you know, $4.99 or buy it for, you know, 10 bucks or 11 bucks, right? On these platforms. So that used to be a big thing. So that's becoming less and less now. And the reason is, is people say, why should I rent a film for $5 when for $7 I can get a month of Disney exactly. plus? Mm-hmm. And you know, that kind of makes sense, Right. And the answer is that I always say the answer is, is because you can't get this film. Mm -hmm. So for $4, that's the the cost of a cup of coffee. You know, you're going to get a 90 minute feature film and you know, it's not that big a deal, but people have lost perspective because Mm -hmm. all of a sudden $4 for a movie is like a big deal (laughs) where it's not for a cup of coffee. Right. right? Um, So he's like 10 bucks, 10 bucks now. Exactly. Yeah. So, but, but you know, but if you can get, a month of Netflix for fourteen ninety nine, and you know the some of the greatest programming in the world on Disney and all these other places for less than ten bucks. Then four dollars seems like a lot of money. So that's really put a dent into transactional. Okay, but and then we're going to get to another reason why there's a big dent. The the major reason that's not that's the secondary reason. There's another bigger reason in a second. So so putting it onto transactional, you still do it. There's a cost to doing it. Sometimes you can't get placement. Like everybody says, you got to be on the front page of Apple and you do if you want to, you know, people to see it, that type of thing. But I'll get to, it's going to all boil down to marketing in a second. So let me just finish with the platforms and we'll get to marketing. That's the big disconnect. All right. So then the other thing is, so then the next level is called AVOD. It's called advertising video on demand. And the big platforms there are like Tubi and Pluto. So basically, you know, consumers can watch all that programming for free. Roku and all this, and but they have to watch commercials now. Exactly. So we have come full circle from what television was, mm-hmm. basically. It's like, mm-hmm. watch the programming free, but watch commercials. The Film Hub is the future of co-working in downtown Vista. Get energized in an inspiring work environment that is built for your success. With multiple membership options for workspace and private offices, you can become a part of our co-working community. The Film Hub makes it easier to produce the professional content your business needs. From video production, live streams, photo shoots, or in-person events, you can create all this and more in our audio and video facilities. (music) 
love your work and where you accomplish it. The Film Hub. And they're embedded and it's hard to skip through them and you can't time shift them. So the technology is such that you got to watch the commercials. Yeah. So, you know, for lots of young people who don't want to spend money on subscriptions or transactional, that, that's a great option. I mean, it doesn't have any revenue back to. Yes. So that you get that. a revenue share. Mm -hmm. So there's based on the amount of viewership, the yeah. amount of sort of time mm -hmm. that and how many commercials are aired and that type okay. of thing, you get a, sh a revenue share. Okay. You know, and some distributors yeah. will tell you that they're making a lot of money on the AVOD. So the way that works is you see a distributor could load up, say, a hundred movies onto an AVOD platform. And if they're making $20 a month off each movie, you know, then they're making, you know, $20,000 a month, mm -hmm. right? Or 200, whatever that is, $2,000 a month. Well, if one movie's making, you know, $100 a month and they're making $20 of it, and then they're sh giving the share to the producer, they might, you know, that producer might be making $5 a month. Yeah. So it's good. It's as a volume business for a distributor. It, I can see it being a decent business because you load it up, you do nothing. You just yeah. wait. And if you've got a hundred movies playing, then great. But if you're an indie filmmaker who's got one movie mm -hmm. and you're getting a check for $5 mm -hmm. a month, which is the reality with a lot of this, mm -hmm. it's not that exciting. Mm -hmm. It's going right? take a so, lot of months. So when everybody, when you, <laughs> you often hear in the articles you read and people talking, oh, AVOD is great, great business. It's working really well. That's you, the, the distributors right. talking because they have the volume. Mm -hmm. yeah. The indie filmmakers, very, very, yeah, very right. seldomly will you hear an indie filmmaker say, oh, I hit a home run on AVOD. Once in a while it happens. And usually when that happens, they switch it over and maybe now they have enough viewership and awareness so that they can go onto an SVOD platform. People say, no, you can't do that. And I say, yes, you can. As soon as there's audience, the big, trans the big uh, streamers, they want your stuff, which leads to the discussion about marketing. All right. So, so now let's say you put your, plat your, your movie onto a, transaction, a couple of transactional platforms, say Amazon and, you know, and iTunes or Apple TV, whatever, and maybe a couple of AVODs. And they're not exclusive, by the way. So you can put it on multiple platforms. Oh, okay. It's not like you have to yeah. put... On SVOD, it's exclusive. You put it, you sell it to Netflix, you can't sell it to anybody else, all right? Yeah. Well, they let you do some transactional stuff, but that's besides the point. But you can be on a couple, right? So let's say you're on two AVOD platforms, two TVOD platforms. So if you're on Tubi or Pluto, you're with 30,000 other movies. Okay, 30,000, maybe more now. Mm -hmm. Like, how is somebody going to find your movie in a sea of 30,000 oh, movies? Mm -hmm. It's called marketing, okay? You can't expect just because you put your movie onto one of these platforms that anybody's going to even know about it. So yeah. people always say, well, if you're going to go onto iTunes, you got to get good placement. And that's why you should use a distributor because they can get you onto the new and noteworthy or the front page or whatever. The first, you know, six weeks is critical because you got to get notoriety and a name going. And it's true. You have to create awareness with audiences. But doing that is easier said than done. And it's costly and it's strategic. And generally they're looking for star-driven movies still, like every other platform. So the question is, it's not getting it on the platforms is less than half the battle. But a lot of you know indie filmmakers say, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with aggregators. I don't want to deal. I'm going to just hire a distributor. They'll put it on the platforms for me. And I say, no problem. Who's going to create the awareness for you? So here's, here's the distribution. Here's what distribution is boiled down to, all right, if you want to be successful as an indie filmmaker. Whether you like it or not, you have to identify, you have to know who your core audience is. And you should really do this before you make your movie, because generally after you make your movie, it's kind of too late. So before you make your movie, you have to do a full marketing plan and a full analysis and say, who is my core niche audience? Like who's really going to want to watch this movie? All right. And you have to identify it. And sometimes you have to build storylines in or character arcs or plot lines or stuff like this that actually have marketing hooks to hook with a core audience. You know, mm -hmm. like you have to, you can't just do this generic. My core audience is like for say a horror film, 18 to 35 year old males. That's everybody's core audience. That's like saying the world is my core audience. Right. Okay. It's really hard to connect with them. Maybe you have to say it's 18 to 35 year old males who play lacrosse, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, you build, you know, one of your characters, you know, 
it's generally six teenagers go in the woods and one comes out and the other rest. Maybe one of them is a lacrosse player, mm-hmm. right? So, and you build in a couple of subplots or whatever so that you can hook into the lacrosse players. Now, I'm making this up, obviously, yeah. but that's the kind of thing you have to do in order to connect to audiences. Mm-hmm. You have to have something that is going to make an audience or a niche core audience, you know, interested. And I always say it's better to have a hundred interested people than 10,000 uninterested people. Okay. Because a hundred interested people who actually watch your movie potentially could tell 10 people, you know, each can tell 10, then you've got a thousand, they could tell 10. That's how it works. All right. So the first thing is you got to know who your audience is. Like if you can't identify who you're going to sell your movie, who's going to want to watch your movie before you make it, you might not want to make it. Like it's not going to match. An audience doesn't magically appear after you make your movie. It, you need to figure this out before. Okay. So th- now you figured it out. The second question is, which is the hardest one is how do you connect to that audience? Like where do those people live? Do they live on social media? Like let's use my example. Okay. You made a horror film and I say, build in a lacrosse player. Okay. So you can go onto social media and try to hit the 18 to 35 year old male crowd, which is going to be super expensive, really hard to do um, properly because they're, it's so diluted and they're so distracted with so many other things and they're not really going to be interested in your horror film. All right. So it's going to be tough to do that, but maybe what you can do is hit the lacrosse teams and say, Hey, even though this is a horror film, our main character is a lacrosse player and you might want to see a lacrosse player fighting off a monster Mm -hmm. with his lacrosse stick or shooting Mm -hmm. his rubber ball at him or whatever, cut a cool trailer and hook him that way. And that way you can do direct marketing to teams, to organizations, to the lacrosse association. I don't even know Mm -hmm. if it exists, you know, I'm just making Mm -hmm. all this stuff up, but that's the idea. So now you can try to target those people directly. And say, yeah, this is a cool film. There's not a lot of movies with lacrosse players in them. This one has it, even though it's not about lacrosse, um, but it's got enough there and you cut a cool trailer and, you know, maybe feature that. So it gives you at least a chance to hook that audience. People who say young, you know, males who play lacrosse say, hey, I'm going to watch this because it's kind of cool. And it's not my kind of movie, but, eh, you know, there's a lacrosse guy there. Something like that. Okay. You got to get super creative. So now at least you're getting your message out to them. You, you, you know who they are and you know where to find them. You know, you maybe hook up with some teams or associations or something. So at least there's buzz about it. And your message is, hey, we made this cool movie. Watch it. So then the third thing is, where are you going to send them to watch it? You got to make it available. So you got to have it on a platform. All right. You don't need 10 platforms if, unless you want that. You need one or two or whatever. Mm-hmm. So this is tricky here because because you, and this is where distribution comes in. So you could use an aggregator, put it up yourself, or you could use a distributor and they put it up, right? But generally, this is, this is a transitional thing that's happening right now. The question is, do consumers need to go to a platform that they're comfortable with already? I'm actually testing this out right now. See, there's, how many streaming platforms do you think there are out there right now? Over, there's over 200 in the United States. Probably 300 by now. Last time, I, this was about two months ago that I did the research. It was about 200. There's probably an extra 100 now. Okay. 90% of them won't exist next year because they won't have enough business to sustain themselves. So, but the question is who's niche enough? Who's getting the audience? Who's engaging, right? So, but the other question is what will consume, con, which consumers are comfortable going to what platforms? So will a consumer want to transact or or watch a platform that they've never heard of because they might think it's not legitimate, do you have to send them to a legitimate platform that's been around, like an Amazon, or like where they have an account already, or an iTunes where they have an account, or, you know, or Voodoo or something like that? These are big platforms that have a lot of credibility and have been around a long time. Does a consumer need that, or will they be willing to go to sort of this niche new platform, even though it's very professional and set up properly and everything like that, but they've never transacted with it before? So that's a new reality that's being tested now. It's hard to say. Um, so anyways, you send them to that platform. And then the fourth thing is when you get them there, how do you monetize that? If it's a transactional platform, obviously they're going to rent or, you know, buy your movie. And depending on what platform you are, there's different revenue shares. Like Amazon takes 50%. iTunes takes 30%, you know, some of these other platforms, these newer ones take 10%, you know? So depending on where you send them, there's a certain revenue share on transactional, but on advertising video on demand, that's super, super diluted. So like I gave you the example before, I mean, 
yeah, you might do 500 transactions or, you know, movies viewings for the month and end up with a $50 check because hmm. it just depends on how much advertising is done on that movie at that time. So you, you have to kind of wait to see, you know, what's interest, you know, what, what they've done. But the biggest question is how do you connect with your audience and drive them to watch your movie? Because the disconnect now is that distributors do not do that. Okay, in the day, like when I was, you know, in distribution, you would license, like our company, we'd license a movie mm -hmm. and we would have an entire marketing campaign for it. We would spend money. No, obviously we charge it back to the filmmaker, but we would, we would market the film. Mm -hmm. We would put it out. We would do, you know, advertising and publicity and all this kind of stuff. We would create awareness for it. Is that uh, amount of money that you spend for that? Is that still the same percentage today? Or is it more or less? In other well, words, the, the, the difference today is that the filmmaker needs to do that themselves. So they're incurring that expense. Right. Whereas before the distributor did, now they charged it back to you. Right. So you, that was the complaint. Oh, look at how much they spent, you know, and mm -hmm. charging me back. But you didn't put out the cash. They did. Right. Today you do. So the, yeah, your question is, what's the amount? Right. The amount is the more you spend, the better chance you have of being successful. So let's, let's start with the Hollywood model, okay? Hollywood, if in case you hadn't noticed, when they make a $100 million movie, they spend like no less than $75 million marketing it. They, their marketing department, they, they do not mess around. I mean, the, the marketing department in some ways drives the entire project. They don't, I, you know, my theory is they don't make a film until the marketing department green lights it and says, hey, this is how we're going to market it. This is the audience and everything like that. Because they're not messing around because they know that marketing is, you know, what really creates success. And, and the marketing, they, first of all, they have a marketing department, right? Secondly, the marketing department in a studio, they're not filmmakers. They're marketing majors. These people all went to business school. I mean, they, you know, they're okay. in the office buildings. They're not on the lot. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in making the movies. They're interested in pitching the audiences and selling. They're experts in it. Now you switch gears to the indie film world. Number one, no indie film company has a marketing department. Right. No indie filmmaker. Yeah. No indie filmmaker even knows about marketing let alone has any money to spend on marketing. All right. So there's a lack of know-how. There's a lack of interest. Even if they did know what they were doing, they're not interested in doing it. And there's a lack of resources. They don't have the money. So my, what I'm saying is the new reality is if you're going to make an indie film, you need to one, really think about marketing before you make it and to budget it. So in mm -hmm. your budget, you have to, and I say the more you can do the better. All right but do no less than 20% of your budget tuck away from marketing. So if you're going to make a half a million dollar film, you tuck away another hundred thousand. So it's not like my film's 500. So I'm going to spend 400 on the film and you know, hundred on marketing. No, my film is 500. I need to raise 600 because I need to tuck away a hundred for marketing. That is painful for an indie filmmaker. For, it's painful in two ways. One is raising money for marketing. Like I don't do marketing. I'm a filmmaker. Marketing's not my thing. And I say, make it your thing. If you want to have a success and that's nothing, you should be doing 50% like the studios, right. mm -hmm. like a hundred thousand is just a pittance. It's not really going to get you very far, but at least it's a start. Um, the other thing is they all do this. I mean, I'm telling you 95% of filmmakers, they get, they spend the 500 and they're so close now they're in posts and they just want that extra song or that extra thing. And well, we got a hundred sitting there for marketing. Let's just, nobody's going to notice. We'll take 25 out for the mm -hmm. song. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, don't do that. That marketing fund, you don't even yeah, think about that. Mm -hmm. That's for marketing. Do not touch that. Do not spend that for your, for your production. But everybody's tempted to, because they only think about their production. They never think about their marketing. Okay. All right. I've said enough. <laughs> Then for the Indies, it's an alternative for the foreign market. Is that even more difficult, the foreign market? It's the relate. Yes, the foreign market is tricky. You're going to need to use a distributor, all right? And that is because you have language barriers, you have customs, you know, different, you know, regulations. You know, like, I'll give you an example. You want to sell to a TV in France or Canada, mm -hmm. where I'm from? The law is you have to use a French-based distributor. Yeah. They won't buy from you mm -hmm. unless you have a company there. Same in Canada, okay? Mm -hmm. The studios, when they first came to Canada, they had to use Canadian distribution companies in order to sell to Canadian television. Then sooner or later, they opened their own companies and they were Canadian operations. Hmm. But that's the law. So you can't even do it yourself. 
for the most part. You have to do it, let alone navigating language barriers and regional customs and knowing the customers. You, an indie filmmaker has enough on their plate just doing domestic if they even want to try that. Mm -hmm. Doing international, I yeah. highly, highly recommend you get in with, you know, an international distributor. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a good question. So now I've got, say I've spent a 500000 I got 100000 for P&A um, marketing. Can but I now, just stop you, Jim? Yeah. P&A &A and marketing are totally exist. different. Okay. <laughs> P&A is part of marketing. Okay. okay. P&A is prints and ads. And generally yeah. when you say that, that is for releasing your film theatrically. theatrically. And I'm okay. telling you right now as an indie filmmaker, do not do that. Okay. You will lose all that money. Gotcha. So we're going to go back to marketing now. So um, you take that money and you spend it to put yourself at the top of this pile of 30,000 other films that are on this platform. And then you're going to make five to $10 a month. How, why would I make an indie film? Okay. Great question. Okay. First of all, let me just correct what you said. You're not spending the money to put yourself on top of the pile. You're, you're in the pile. All right. But the way it's, the pile is, is not linear. I mean, it's, it's, it's digital. So, so you could be at the bottom of the pile because there is no so-called pile. It's a C. It's a C. Okay. And everybody's in it. You're spending the hundred thousand dollars so that you can tell people where to go in the sea to find you. So it's not like you got to be on the top or the bottom. The only time the top and bottom matters is say on a platform like iTunes, where you want to be on the first page because that helps you gotcha. get attention. But if you can draw, if you, if you draw your audience to say, Hey, we're on iTunes, just search it. When you get there, you don't have to be on the first page. They just have to type in your title and they'll find it in that sea. You're spending the money so that your audience knows about your title and can go look for it. That's what you're spending the money. It's what right. I call audience awareness. Okay. It's not necessarily, can I, it's metaphoric. Okay. Mm. Maybe that's what you meant. No, that, that, no, that makes sense. It's okay. not what I meant. It's not, okay. It's not being like front and center. It's being, I'm going to go look for mm -hmm. that movie specifically. Yeah. So I'm going on to Tubi and the, my mission is not to see what they have. My mission is to find that movie that I just heard about exactly. that, you know, I got that social media feed on something. Okay. And they said, find me on Tubi. And then you go there and you type it in and you look for that movie specifically. That's where you're spending your marketing dollars. All right. So they, so I spent the marketing dollars, but still the return is so small. No, no. The return that I talked about is, is generally if you don't spend marketing uh, okay. dollars. Okay? okay. It's maybe, maybe somebody will accidentally That's find you. That's a big deal. Okay. So now the more you spend, and it's not a direct correlation, it's how, you, how strategic you are. And in a lot of cases, how lucky you are, right? That your marketing spend is actually resonating with people and they're creating interest to watch your movie. It's like anything else. It's like advertising, right? And a lot of it is how many times the message comes across and, and how compelling the message is. And hopefully that will generate more viewership, especially transactional. You know, saying, hey, it's worth spending the $5 to watch my movie commercial free. Don't go to Tubi where you got to watch commercials. Go to iTunes or to Amazon where you can watch it without commercials. And if you can get a core audience to do that, then then you can mm -hmm. make a lot more money. You know, if a you get 100,000 people to watch at $5. That's 500,000. iTunes is going to take 30%. So, you know, you're going to end okay. up with 350,000. But it's still pretty good. Now, there are people who have done this successfully. Again, I'm going to look at the camera. It's not easy. It's very hard. <laughs> right. Very, very hard to do this. Right. Okay. So don't think just because you do it, it's going to happen. Right. All right. But if you do it properly, at least you're in the game. So there's a couple of people who I know, because I have these clients, right, who have done this enormously successfully um, because they have audiences. So there's mm. one guy, I'm not going to say his name, but ever, he's a rapper and he made this movie and the movie's, you know, okay, it's kind of about his life. It's not a great movie. It's not terrible, but it's not a great movie. I watched it, right? But his yeah, audience is, his audience is so loyal. Mm -hmm. And he knew he had this audience. So his niche core audience was his music mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. He makes this movie and he says, I want you to go to my own website. Puts it up on his own website. Sure. No streaming platform. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. guess how much he charges to watch his movie? $20. $20 he charges. Yeah. No fees because it's on his own website. And gets like a half well, a million dollar that's down. That's a whole other opportunity. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because, exactly. he, because he has a loyal audience who is willing to pay $20 to watch this movie. That's called great marketing. No, I yeah, think it's great. Out of distribution. You you have to, but and if you're not a good rapper, you still 
can develop a core audience Correct. in some oh, other yeah. manner. Oh, yeah. And I think that's where you have to start in this film business, and, maybe. And a lot of filmmakers say, hey, maybe I should put these rappers into my movie. Maybe I should some uh, social yeah. media influencers into my movie. Maybe. Mm. So a lot of people are trying this, okay, gotcha. right? Mm. Building in people who have core audiences into your there movie you so that you have mm. a marketing hook before you start. That's the answer it's I was not, looking for. It's not necessarily the answer, but it's a good strategy. I right? think it's a great strategy. Yeah. But I think that's exactly what we're doing in Latin America. We are capturing the people that recognize, whether they're musicians, mm -hmm. or some, they're, sometimes they're not good actor and actresses, but we incorporate them and they have followers. Right. They just but they, okay, that look, at, that's why Hollywood uses A-list actors mm. yeah. because people say who's in it. Yeah. And when they recognize the name, they'll go see the movie, right? Yeah. So I, you know, I have some clients who have used a lot of social media influencers who technically, you know, have millions of followers on social media. And sometimes it's worked and sometimes it's failed. And I'm going to tell you the reason generally, I think why it's failed is because they make bad movies. Yes. They mm -hmm. think, okay, I'll throw some social media influencers and we'll have right. 2 million followers. But if the movie's not good, yeah. everybody's actually, it's a negative because then they get on social they media and trash. say, this is the <laughs> biggest <laughs> piece of trash I've ever seen. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you still got to, you don't, do not uh, think just because you got people with audiences that you got to yeah. still make a decent yeah, movie. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing is you've got the content is king and that's what we've always heard. One more thing. Um, there's another way that might work. I'll run it past you, see what you think. What happens if you just write the script and then sell the script to... Who are you going to sell it to? Hello? Give me one person who's going to buy your script. You're a brand new screenwriter. You have no credits. You have no... Nobody knows about you. What do you think you're going to write this script? And nobody's even going to read it, Jim. I hate to burst your bubble and or everybody else's who's listening to this. But if you but, promote it... Well, the, the, okay, so, so, so I, I have lots of clients who are exactly that so yeah. wrote a great script and I'm not saying the scripts are really good, Yeah, but they don't have agents. They don't have producers. So they say, I just need to find a producer who's going to want to produce it. They have a hundred scripts. These producers, they're writing their own. They have them. They're not looking necessarily for scripts. Again, you just have to f stumble into that and hope that you get lucky or have a great, great agent who can put it in front of the right people. Okay. Really, really tough. And, uh, and generally I tell my script writer friends is what you need is a great script and you need a little bit of cash. Okay. Cause you need to be able to say to the producer, Hey, I'll put in, you know, if you, we, let's make a half a million dollar budget. I'll put in a hundred thousand. You find the other 400. Then the conversation begins. Ah, okay. Right. See, there you That's go. That's how the conversation begins. That's what I'm looking it's for. It's not just, I have a great script. Say, thanks a lot. I have 50 great scripts. Okay. I have a great script on a hundred grand. Then you can okay, have okay. a conversation. Okay. So then that's what they want to hear. And then perhaps then you can set up your distribution before the film is even shot. Yes. No, not anymore. Not with indie films. Okay. You can set up your strategy. You can kind of know who your audience is like we talked about, but you're not getting any pre-sales. Now you might get a distributor who comes on and says, Hey, I'd be interested. Let me see the film, but they're not giving you a minimum guarantee. They're not, they're going to say, I need to see the film first. All right. And even when they see the film, the chances are they're not going to give you a minimum guarantee because um, they don't need to because they have the choice of 10,000 other films out there. Uh, you feel like that's the same thing with television, too, if you wrote like an episodic series. Uh, you're not going to get the time of day take, from anybody. Look at you. no, you're not going to get the time of day unless so you need an agent. You need a, a darn good agent. You need a can or you need somebody like who you're related to, you know, in who can get you in the door. Okay. They just have too many in-house projects that they're working on by themselves already. And, and frankly, they don't want to read yours. Do you know why they don't read it? Because if yours is similar to theirs, which it usually oh. is, then you're going to say you stole my yeah, idea. So they, they don't even open the envelopes. They rip them up. They throw them in the, mm. they send them right back unopened because they don't want to be sued. Right. And that's understandable because there's been a lot of those cases yeah. over the years. Yeah, exactly right. And that's the case with uh, Pirate of the Caribbean, our friend, you know, yeah. who wrote the well, thing. Well, there's classic stories yeah. of that. Beverly Hills Cop. I mm -hmm. mean, there's big stories from Hollywood mm -hmm. where people say, oh, I sent you that before. Yeah. And they did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't mean they copied it. Like, it, it, the, how many ideas are truly original? I mean, yeah. it's, chances are that some... Mm -hmm. fancy Hollywood team of writers has thought something that you've right. thought. Yeah. So exactly. they don't want to get in a legal bind. So that's why they don't even look at your stuff. Okay. That's great. Well, so that's great what information. Would be the good word for indies out there. Yeah. What's the good word? The good word is <laughs> if, if you can navigate this process properly and you can, you know, get through it all and, and have thick enough skin to go through all the things, but 
pre-plan everything. Okay. Don't just think you got to make a movie, plan your marketing campaign, plan everything and, and finance it all. Do the, be a business person. Mm -hmm. If you can be a business person in addition to a filmmaker or or associate yourself with a business person. And maybe you don't like doing all that stuff, mm. but hook up with somebody who does. All right. So that you got it all covered. Then you got a chance. All right. And and if you there have you a go. chance, you're in the game and it's a great business. If you're, if you do it properly and you're in the game, I'm not saying it's going to work for sure, but at least you're giving yourself a shot. All right. There we I go. I think it's some great advice, huh? Okay. People had to go back into school and get some... Uh, they don't have to go. They just have to find people who graduated. Who went to school. Like, yeah. <laughs> a film student has... I, th I tell my film students this. You go walk over to the business mm -hmm. school and you associate with a couple of marketing students. Mm -hmm. That's who you're going to need in your there career. Right. You get tight with them and you, be, you guys become a team. There we go. All right. Well, there it is. Marketing is a big key and uh, good content and agents and some money and... Got a and good a chance at this and, and a, a plan. plan. Yeah. Well, so that's great I, stuff. I think we had to bring back Jeff sometime to talk about more about the future, the new technologies and all of that, what is going, because I know there's a lot, a lot of things happening, especially now that Twitter uh, was bought and <laughs> what is all coming with this and platforms and things like that. So a lot of technology, Omniverse, Metaverse, all that thing is a brand new, exciting new you know, products out there. So you have to come back to talk about that. Sure. <laughs> All right. I, heard I that. thought by now you're sick of me, but whatever. Uh -huh. no, <laughs> no. we'll do it. I haven't got sick yet. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. You let sure. me know. Appreciate it. So All again, right. if you want to know more about Jeff, go to deveretmedia.com. And of course, uh, this is the film hub and you can find more information on us on filmhubinc.com. Also follow our Instagram and Facebook. All right. Till next time. This is Industry Insights with Jim and Elias. The Film Hub. Inspire the creative. Ignite the world.